Hello. On today's scope, we feature animals and babies. First, we examine the medical profession, which is using dogs to test artificial blood. And then we'll switch to cows, and we'll show you how we bathe them in electricity to rid them of insects and increase their productivity. And as for babies, we'll introduce a new form of babysitting on the Internet. And for the thrill seekers today, a comprehensive look at roller coasters, how they're made, and what dangers they pose. So our eclectic show today is a treat for everyone. Welcome aboard. Man's best friend is making another contribution in its relationship with humans. In this case, dogs are being used in the testing of artificial blood. The first valid substitute for blood to be used in emergency situations has recently been approved by the FDA. It's called oxyglobin, and it's being tested on dogs, successfully I may add. A similar product, developed with the same technology, is now being tried on human beings. In emergency cases, transfusions can't be accomplished without testing the compatibility of blood between the patient and the donor. Besides, blood must be properly stored in freezers or refrigerators. The risk of contamination is always present. Since World War II, when 4,000 soldiers died due to lack of available blood for transfusions, researchers have been probing to find a blood substitute. Oxyglobin is the first product suitable for anemia, which is the lack of red corpuscles which feed oxygen to the body. Oxyglobin distributes oxygen through the tiny hemoglobin molecules that travel through the plasma, the fluid components of blood, thus enabling the patient to survive. We asked Dr. C. Everett Koop, former Surgeon General of the U.S., if oxyglobin is going to replace blood banks. No, it will not replace blood banks, but what it will do is will make blood banks ever so much more efficient. Today, when you take, you take your blood to the blood bank, they put it in, in line. The next fresh blood goes behind yours, the next fresh goes behind that. So that when your blood gets to somebody, it may be quite old. And therefore, if we have the ability to use something like uh, this hemoglobin solution, uh, we can relieve blood banks so that they can deal more efficiently with fresh blood products, which of course I think would uh, suit them as well too. Veterinarian Robert Murtaugh is using oxyglobin to treat Sam, who was struck by a car and lost a lot of blood on the way to the hospital. Sam was hanging in the balance for the first uh, few hours that he was with us. He, he was in shock and he had uh, significant injuries and there was question about whether Sam was going to survive or not after the oxyglobin had been administered and within 24 hours it was apparent that Sam was going to go on and make a full recovery related to the anemia or the blood loss and uh, the oxyglobin was uh, instrumental in, in allowing that to happen. Sam's owner, Linda Porter, is satisfied with the results. When he got the oxyglobin it really just picked up very quickly so they felt very comfortable sending him home a lot sooner which made us a lot happier too. The key to treatment in emergency and in life and death situations is oxygen supply to tissues. The next time we came up here, it was really amazing how much more lively he was. Oxyglobin is produced by collecting and purifying cow's blood. In contradiction to regular blood, it can be stored at room temperature, has a shelf life of two years, and mingles well with any kind of blood. In the canine tests, a few side effects were detected, such as nausea and vein expansion, but these were rare. The pluses really outweighed the minuses. Well, if blood is indicated, if you're dealing with a life and death situation or an emergency critical care circumstance, and blood is not available and it's indicated, that animal could die. Well, I think oxyglobin represents uh, probably uh, 
one of the single most important developments in veterinary medicine since I've been a veterinarian. Each unit of oxyglobin costs $150, which is the same price charged by a regular canine blood bank. BioPure, the company that developed oxyglobin, has tested it on 350 people. The results, according to Carl Roche, president and CEO of the company, are very promising. We believe that oxyglobin will validate our technology and allow us to support the development of the human product, which will be one of the largest therapeutic categories of the next decade. Cows bathed in electricity. Does that improve milk quality? Well, let's take a look. You're witnessing a routine morning in the dull life of cows at this American farm. Stable congestion, the milking process, a rewarding meal, and insects galore. At a recent convention between the University of Maryland and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a solution to the insect problem was developed. Worried over the loss of productivity caused by flies and other parasites who suck the blood and energy of the cows, agronomists installed tunnels with electric panels. The principle is simple. The ultraviolet light attracts the flies and goodbye pests. Biologist and AG worker Wendy Painter is checking the cow's demeanor at the farm. Actually, it's a very basic, simple idea. You use the cow as the carrier. The flies are on the animal. As the animal walks to the unit, the cow carries the flies with them. There are curtains that hang inside that brush uh, the flies off the face, the shoulders, the back, um, and also helps to dislodge the flies around their feet and on their bellies also. It causes kind of a swarming effect. Um, and then the flies that are dislodged are attracted to the electrical grids. And uh, as soon as the fly touches the grid, they're electrocuted and killed. According to her, the great advantage of this system is it replaces expensive pesticides that pollute the atmosphere and are harmful for human beings. Plus, the cows are producing more milk. Another problem with using pesticides is that the flies have become very intelligent. They have learned to manipulate their genetic material in order to become immune to these pesticides. And the only effective way to use these sorts of systems is to rotate which specific chemicals you're using. Eventually, the flies are just going to be immune to everything, and you're going to have to keep coming up with new chemicals and new things to use. With this particular unit, the nice thing is that there's no chemicals used. The flies will never become immune to electricity. That will always be a problem for them, so uh, it's a very effective way of controlling them. Wendy observed that it takes cows three days to adapt to the new routine. As long as they see a light at the end of the tunnel, they don't resist. And this cow is obviously hungry for exposure as it poses for the camera. The fact that this unit works so well and is so non-invasive to the animal and non-invasive to the environment, I think it's just going to be the wave of the future. This electrical process also helps the farmers who have less flies to contend with. It reduces the fly population on the animal itself by having them carry it to the unit and destroy pretty much all the flies that are on the animal itself at that time. But it also prevents the fly from flying back into the barn and um, laying eggs in the pen pack or in specific areas where you know, flies are attracted to, to lay eggs. Um, if the fly is not available to lay eggs, then that population to be will never occur. The next step is to equip the panels with solar energy, less costly and more effective. A photograph of your son or daughter on your office desk isn't the only way to keep an eye on them while you work. Now we have internet daycare, and you never lose sight of what your children are up to. Playtime for kids used to be a worry time for parents. Well, no longer. Robert Ritter is an engineer in a satellite company. He and his wife work all day and leave their 16-month-old son, Joseph, in daycare. Except now, Robert can check up on him through the internet. I get a, a nice sense of security. Uh, I can see him, as, a, as you say, anytime I want. Um, it is it's really comforting to know that I can get on there. I appreciate the technology. 
There are five cameras placed in the sunflower room where Joseph plays most of the day, and also in the playground. Using a code, Robert accesses his son's whereabouts and activities periodically. This is it. This is the room here. It's the wide angle shot. So this is uh, most of the room. The only thing that's over here is just a small kitchenette area where he doesn't play. And who gets access to your code? Access is given to the parents and you are allowed to select some family members and give it to the school and request additional passwords. And We've selected passwords for my wife's brother who lives in Paris and my mother who lives in Florida. and. Some of the parents in the school uh, have spouses that work overseas. In fact, uh, one woman I know, her spouse works in uh, Saudi Arabia. And so I know that they just love this technology. Ada Adnan is the director of the daycare center, which is the only facility in Washington, D.C. currently offering this service. There's different ways of viewing it. Um, there is the concern of really what's going on in daycares. There's, um, you know, whether there is good staff, good teachers, really looking after the children, safety, security. The other aspect, which is I think the aspect we're looking at, is that parents can really enjoy watching their child. But like everything else on the internet, it's accessible to everyone and the children's images can be viewed by anyone. Despite the protection of access codes, there's so much overlapping of families that unauthorized viewing is virtually impossible to stop. Nevertheless, Ada feels that the results are worth this potential invasion of privacy. One important aspect is that they're not able to know what daycare this is. There is nothing that says this is um, so-and-so daycare. Uh, there is no names written, so they won't be able to find out a child's name. And really, the pictures are not so, so clear to be able to identify a certain child. Only the parent would be able to, or some, a family member. Um, so I really don't find it as a threat. I don't feel that there's any threat to his safety having this online on the internet. And uh, I would feel more concerned with somebody looking in the window at him like they could do at any daycare facility. Images are transmitted instantaneously every four seconds, enough for Robert to keep a close watch on little Joseph. Probably right now, four or five times a day, I get on there and I look at him. And it shows about two or three minutes worth of, of shots at a time and then it shuts itself off. So I will do that right now four or five times a day, but it's, it's kind of a novel thing. I, hope, I imagine that my, uh, the, the company here would appreciate it if I look at it less and less in the future. We don't want to take too much time. Bye-bye. Ciao. We asked Ms. Adnan what prompted her to start this progressive daycare program. I'm a mother of two, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to work with my own children and spend the whole day with them. And I find that giving other mothers and parents and grandparents this opportunity is really special. The big plunge is the most terrifying few seconds of an amusement ride. I'm referring to the new roller coasters. They're bigger, better, and more daring than ever. But are they safe? Let's find out. As the coaster edges over the 250-foot high apex of the track, there's a split-second pause between dread and thrill that feels like eternity. And then the 90-foot drop at speeds of 80-plus miles per hour, tears streaming out of the corner of your eyes and your stomach just shy of the stratosphere. Essentially, the big thrill, the ultimate rush. Jay Chrysler and Michael Wright are the geniuses behind the new and improved roller coasters. Schoolmates at the University of Maryland, they both got engineering degrees, and now they're designing coasters for premier rides in Maryland. I guess you, you think about what's the most intense feeling you could have, and it's just getting accelerated to as fast as possible, as so fast as a body could handle, you know, without it being too dangerous or passing out. And that's the feeling you want to feel, and that's the feeling we've achieved. put you in a roller coaster and we launch you, just like on an aircraft carrier or a rocket. Or it's a similar feeling. To achieve this sensation, they use linear induction motors that propel the train. In lieu of circular motion, these motors create straight line movement. The excitement starts at the beginning of the ride in anticipation of the deep falls, a far cry from the older coasters. What people 
years ago, all they did was drag you up a hill and, and let you go. Gravity takes care of the rest. We have potential energy. The higher you go, the more energy you have, the more energy you have, the more faster you can make the trains accelerate. There was a time when the tallest was, was 100 feet off the ground, and you've tripled that now. So. Mike and Jay built a roller coaster in New Jersey with an appropriate name, Batman and Robin. Jim Shea, president of Premier Rides, explains. Batman and Robin, the chiller here at Six Flags Great Adventure, is the cutting edge ride of the industry right now. It represents the innovative, leading edge of the industry. And what you see here is a roller coaster that no longer uses just an old-fashioned lift hill, which used to take a train up very high, slowly, and drop you down. Here the excitement starts when the operator hits the go button right in the beginning. How this ride works is we take a tremendous amount of energy, several thousand amps, and those amps are dumped into the ride, and these linear induction motors create a magnetic wave which travels down a 200-foot launch zone. The train literally rides this wave, almost like surfing the magnetic wave as it accelerates from zero to 70 miles an hour. In fact, Batman and Robin are two separate rides. In each one, you first advance and then retreat, all at high speed. What a rush. Not only are there linear induction motors at the beginning of the ride, which accelerate you from zero to 70 miles per hour, but as you go through the ride experience, this is a forward and backwards experience. As you go forward through the ride, you lose energy because of friction and because of the wind drag. In this ride, when you get up to the 200-foot level, there are additional linear induction motors that both accelerate you higher and accelerate you backwards to make up for some of the energy that's lost so you can come back into the station at the original speed that you left. Magnetic brakes stop the train slowly and smoothly as it arrives back at the station. Mike explains the process of building one of these monstrous rides. You have conception, and everybody sits down and thinks about what they want. Then you have, um, you have a design phase, and you go through the, the various aspects of the ride in, in terms of designing. Don't you then have a cool. production phase. Things are fabricated. I don't, I don't um, and once the ride is installed, then you have your, your testing and the phase where everybody gets to get on board once it's all worked out. <laughs> There's an expert support group who takes care of all the details and monitors safety procedures. There's an, a tremendous amount of science. Uh, you've got electrical engineers who work on, for example, our linear induction motors, structural engineers for supporting the track and doing the columns, et cetera, mechanical engineers like myself to do mechanical portions of the ride. There is almost like a brain pool, I think, involved in putting one of these together. There's people who have been doing it for years and have amassed an unbelievable amount of experience and are very well respected in the industry because of that. Uh, there aren't that many people around the world who, who do the kinds of things that we do. If intelligence matches the size of the head, then we're all well served. Right now we have an example of the largest head we could possibly hey, find. Come off. Off. My, my, my nickname in high school was Big Head. <laughs> what Jay is doing is measuring head size and posture for the sake of comfort and safety. The head of a passenger should not veer more than 45 degrees forward during the ride. I'm doing a brain measurement. Ah, oh, genius. While working, Mike and Jay kid each other a lot, oh, yeah, never losing sight of the fact that their job is a serious one. I would say we, we probably work together pretty well. Uh, Jay and I have known each other for, for such a long time that we're very comfortable in a room with one another. And Jay always says that that's a, an advantage of us working together as opposed to working with somebody we probably don't know. Sometimes we share projects, sometimes we have different projects, and if I'm working on something and I need a fresh set of eyes or, or a different opinion, I'll just say, hey, Mike, what do you think of this? What do you think of this approach? How would you do this? So it's just great to have him there. They do have differences of opinion from time to time, but familiarity in their case does not breed contempt. You know, we work in the same office and we're bound to, to get on each other's nerves, so to speak, but, but he and I, because of our relationship, I think we can do that very well. I can come right out and say, hey, Jay, you're bothering me because you did this, or 
more often Jay says to me, hey, you're bothering me because you did this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more like a brother relationship. I don't, I don't get offended. I know he's going to be there tomorrow. He'll still be my friend. He'll still respect me. What about the future of roller coasters? There is a tendency right now or a trend of, of doing extreme, doing fast, doing really hard rides. There are people who still want family rides, the things where you can take the smaller children and it's not a problem. I enjoy both ends of that. Um, I enjoy the entertainment side, but I also enjoy that pushing the limit and, and pushing danger, but in a secured fashion um, where you know you're really safe. I can't believe what we're building today, and I want to see what we're building 10 years from now and 15 years from now. I know it's going to be impressive. Well, that was quite a show. I'm a little dizzy from watching the roller coasters go up and down and up and down and <laughs> up and down. How about that internet babysitting? What will they think of next? Don't worry, they'll think of something. <laughs> we have plenty more unique and topical subjects in store on our next show. So until we meet again, goodbye for now.